Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wi-Fi Now TV in association with RCR Wireless News. My name is Klaus Heading. I'm your host. And on this week's show, three great topics. Mobile Wi-Fi convergence. We're going to talk about that with David Haight. He's a super expert. A new Wi-Fi invention from NASA JPL will save you 99.9% .9 of your battery power. We're going to talk to Adrian Tang of JPL, NASA JPL. And finally, the battle for the five gigahertz band, LTEU versus Wi-Fi. David Witkowski of Mobile Experts and CEO of WCA is here. We'll catch up with him at the end of the program. Join us in just a second. Nexius, accelerating network and business transformation. Telecom Careers, the number one global telecom and wireless job board. Telecomcareers.com. Welcome back, everybody, and welcome to Wi-Fi Now. This week, we've got three great topics that, I, as I just mentioned, we're going to talk a lot on this show about mobile Wi-Fi convergence. I've got a great guest, David Height is his name, and he's a super strategist and also very knowledgeable in this space. He's been working on it for a long time. We're going to bring him on in a second. Also, NASA JPL has developed a new Wi-Fi chip that will allow you to save 99.9%, uh, .9%, believe it or not, of your battery consumption short range. Adrian Tang is on the show. We're delighted to have him. Welcome, Adrian. And uh, David Witkowski, he's an analyst with Mobile Experts, also the president and CEO of WCA Wireless, uh, Wireless, uh, <laughs> I forget what it's called it. Uh, organization uh, of California. He's got a great event coming up uh, later, the, or actually next week, uh, and we're going to talk about the event. We're talking about LTE U versus Wi-Fi. We'll get uh, to David at the end. So uh, I'd like to bring up uh, David Hype, but actually, David, maybe uh, you can comment on a couple of these news items that I picked up from the news stream uh, earlier this week. A couple of things that I think are pointing towards uh, shall we say, the continued evolution of mobile Wi-Fi convergence. The first thing I picked up on was the news that T-Mobile US, T-Mobile USA is partnering with Bright House Networks for Wi-Fi roaming. What that means is that 50,000 T-Mobile subscribers in Florida will be able to test seamless Wi-Fi roaming onto the Bright House uh, network. Bright House, of course, is a major uh, cable operator in that area, one of the uh, big MSOs in the United States. And the users will then be able to roam on to 37,000 hotspots in the Florida area. And I see this as a big step. I've not heard of a mobile operator uh, teaming up with a cable operator in this way before. Uh, if you have, please uh, correct me on that. But I see this as a major step towards the convergence of mobile and Wi-Fi in the consumer space. So. Uh, that was the first thing. The second thing I wanted to mention was also this week, Boingo Wireless uh, point, uh, posted very good second quarter results. They hit their targets, and their CEO said that the interest in offload is pretty amazing and pretty awesome, of course, following up, uh, following on their offload deal with Sprint earlier this year. So, David, there's a lot of things going on with uh, offload, Wi-Fi first. I like to call it convergence. Uh, give us your view on where we're going uh, in this space right now. Okay, uh, thanks, Klaus. The um, uh, you know I look at my own usage as a place to start, and you know I have my trusty Galaxy Note three that I use all the time. Um, and I noticed even a couple of years ago that um, I track the amount of data I use, and on Wi-Fi networks I'm currently running around seven to ten gigs per month. And on cellular, I'm currently running about two to 400 meg. This is on LTE. Um, so definitely a trend that you, you see happening here that, that um, I think we've all kind of learned how to use Wi-Fi. And uh, a lot of times when we can use the wireless services the most is when we're, we're kind of in a place where there is a lot of capability uh, available to us at the mall, at our house, uh, um, you know, at our offices, where it have you. So... So I, I, you know, tying back to your carrier comment, T-Mobile and, and Bright House, you know, you know, combining to have this hotspot service, the way I basically look at the carriers is, is essentially that um, um, they're, they're in the wireless connectivity business. And it's not just about cellular services. Sure, they have their spectrum and 
they can provide that. But overall, they're providing my wireless connectivity. So I think, you know, that's an important step forward and something I expect to see even more of as time uh, is, you know, time continues to advance yeah. here. So David, let me ask you this because I want to refer back a little bit to the T-Mobile story because they're using Hotspot 2.0, which works very well. It's secure, it's seamless and all of that. Uh, but it also doesn't really do anything as far as I know, at least in terms of intelligent network selection and so forth. It's, it's kind of, if you use Passpoint, it's kind of, it works very well on Wi-Fi connection, everything. <coughs> Uh, doesn't really do much for you in terms of, you know, making an intelligent decision. Is that the right way to go or, or how do you see this? It, it's a starting point. You know, I mean, the, the first, the, you know, and we're, we're Hotspot 2.0 or Passpoint and even ADNSF are starting from is what I'll call auto discovery and authentication onto a network um, that your credentials are automatically passed that you're not having to get through a, you know, some sort of uh, login screen all the time so you start there uh, i think as you look at later on versions of these specs they start to address this issue but uh, in our work we've actually seen some uh, operators not so much in north america or in europe but more in asia where you have very dense uh, overlapping wi-fi cellular networks that you know you can overload a hotspot just as much as you can overload a cellular network so you've got to be more intelligent how you manage all you don't shift all your traffic there you start managing your traffic more. So it opens up the door for further advances. But do you think this is inevitable? I mean, we're a couple of analysts probably know more than that over the past couple of years, including myself, who's been, you know, pushing the offload story. I don't actually like the offload word so much anymore. I like to call it convergence because the cost of providing Wi-Fi is so much lower than, than mobile or, and so on. Is it inevitable that we will have that, that we will we'll have convergent networks? And that's the first part, part of the question. The second part of the question is, what do we need in terms of technology? Because NDSF kind of kind of flopped a little bit. There was a lot of us, and now there's all sorts of proprietary clients. Take us through that, if you will. Wow. Okay. Um, hopefully, I've got all the elements of that question. The um, <laughs> the, um, the first part of that. Um, you might have to repeat that one again because I just lost my trail of thought. No, right, yeah. No, okay. So, so do you think it's inevitable that yeah? Uh, inevitable. Yeah. That's, yeah. The interesting thing is I view my cellular subscription, you know, why can't I just have a Wi-Fi subscription and I can do cellular offload? So I look at things like Google Fi, really interesting that you get to roll things like gigabytes on cellular for the next month. So we're already kind of getting in amongst that, that, that that's here. Um, you know, I, would, I wouldn't kind of predict the end of, of cellular, like it's a converged space. Um, You've got wide area, you've got things like reserved areas of spectrum for the various operators that have paid a lot of money for that. So, you know, there, there's a long road to be taken here. Um, I think, turning to the technical side a little bit, I mean, you know, we, we've, I've been around probably, I've been wireless since before 2000. And, um, you know, I'm kind of looking at things like IMS and such that have always just around the corner and, and we're going to get there uh, sometime soon but i have certain problems with that kind of an approach just because it's it's so big capital intensive and, and it's a big bang approach to try and getting all this done where i'm kind of looking for more uh, immediate value from from uh, the technology that somebody can do this and we actually just you know in a way got that as soon as our mobile devices had both wi-fi and cellular radios in them that the creativity spawned, and now we have solutions out there that can make use of this. You know, and we're now starting to see the voice Wi-Fi uh, offerings, you know, coming coming more into a more mature phase where you know they can tie to traditional phone lines, they can do all they can, and we're now starting to see through technologies like like what Provala provides, being able to seamlessly move back and forth between uh, cellular and Wi-Fi networks. We'll see a lot more of that to come. Right. Okay. So take us through that a little bit because I'm very curious about it because you've told me also we've had many conversations, great conversations, by the way, uh, that you, you've told me that Provala does this and you can plug your company on here. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, you do this transparent, seamless, right? But yes. presumably without IP address preservation and stuff like that, or how, well, how does it work? You know, it's important to preserve the IP address and we have a proprietary way of doing that. We, we, we have oh. focus on this. Okay. <laughs> Um, but uh, to kind of give you a little bit more background on how we, we approach this, uh, let, me, let me just start off with 
fundamental premise I run under, and the reason why I'm with Praval is that, you know, as time moves on, I'm going to be su- I'm going to be surrounded by more networks rather than fewer. Whether it's Wi-Fi, whether it's cellular, you know, we have the five gigahertz debate, I guess, coming up a little later on with the show. But you've just got more and more spectrum becoming available for me to potentially use more services. So how does one intelligently move between and decide, you know, which service to be on at a given point in time? So this is where uh, things like networks that are available, uh, quality comes together, um, and then also what is it you're trying to achieve? Am I trying to achieve the best connection? Am I trying to achieve um, uh, most cost-efficient connection? These are all variables. And the way we've kind of attacked the problem is that um, beginning with mobile devices, we, we came up with an approach that very battery efficiently, by the way, and I'm more interested to hear about, more about the battery efficient Wi-Fi um, solution from NASA, but the the, the approach is that basically we can we can very efficiently measure using both the cellular and Wi-Fi radios the relative quality of each network, right? Things like you know latency and and um, um, you know signal strength and and uh, packet loss, those sorts of things. Can we? And, yeah, maybe. Hey, David, do you want to talk around the slide? We can bring up the slide if you want. The slide. Yeah, I, I can talk without it, but uh, yeah, let's bring it up first. Uh, first slide, please, Wilson. Now, while we're waiting for that, I'll just continue to talk, and then the slide will help clarify afterwards. Yeah, so, come up. You know, where where we're sitting is that you've got your network availability, you have you have your quality elements of each network, and then you have your goals or objectives that you're trying to achieve. And the way we designed our solution is we're right in the middle of all that intersection. Um, um, so that that's where it goes. So so I'm not sure if the, the graphic came up or yeah, not. Yeah, it's up there. It's up there. Oh, okay, great. Um, so, so effectively, you can see from my diagram that you know I have a Venn diagram of networks, quality, and goals that you're trying to achieve, and we're we're in the right in the middle at that little X, and and what we're basically trying to do here is we're measuring various network qualities of various networks that are available. We're using you know we're deciding you know is this network that you're on is it good enough is it meeting all your policy goals. Are things going in the right way for you? And, or if we need to switch, we can then act. So we kind of put all that together in one solution that that whole measure, decide, and act. Um, um, and of course, you throw in things like seamless handover. You throw in uh, multi-network aggregation, all those sorts of things to try and make the decision uh, better. There's there's um, uh, probably the biggest space that, that uh, you know, we're kind of very robust in is just in the policy space. Because a lot of times policies may shift and you have policies at the device level, you have policies at, at a server level where an operator or an enterprise or what have you can actually manage the connectivity and, and set certain parameters. So let's say you know we have a major event coming, I put up a whole bunch of temporary Wi-Fi uh, as either the event provider or an operator, the person's using our application and the policies will say shift, shift to these hotspots. The other element of the product that that really doesn't come through in the diagram, but is is critical to all this, is that the information, the quality information, is reported and aggregated in real time, and it can be used as a feedback back to the device. So that's to prevent things like six thousand people simultaneously jumping on the same access point. That we can we can meter that out to various access point and measure them more. Right. Okay. So David, you have some. Yeah, obviously, some service providers that you're working with in this respect. You want to speak a little bit about what their experiences might be with this? Sure. I mean, I would say from a service provider perspective, we're fairly early on. A lot of them are just now looking at, you know, they have both cellular deployed, and there's obviously lots of really, really extravagant tools to measuring how well my cellular coverage is, and they've deployed a lot of Wi-Fi hotspots. And what we can provide to them is a single tool or an application that not only that only helps them measure what the relative quality is of their their overall um, network capability, or uh, given their heterogeneous networks, both Wi-Fi and cellular. Um, but we can also then use that in a more management way. So a lot of a lot of, um, in fact, some of our customers in Asia are actually more from the cable side that uh, are getting into the hotspot space. They're not traditional cellular operators. 
but they're kind of expanding out their reach from that perspective. So we have we have that going on. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of other uh, uh, um, ideas and things that are going on. We're, we're uh, in North America. We're kind of more working with the over-the-top providers that uh, we have a provider in the U.S. now that that um, is using our technology to do the seamless handover from Wi-Fi to cellular and back again. So your voice call is not interrupted. It just flows seamlessly back and forth. So I have a number of other uh, uh, prospects that are kind of getting interested in our technology for that. Well, wow, it's great. And, and, and you also mentioned what we talked uh, earlier this week that there's some indication that maybe some of the big venues are interested in this. I remember, I think you mentioned some a place like Universal Studios, like a theme park where oh, they- Sure, sure. I mean, well, that, that's, a, that's a whole other story, but, yeah. but uh, you know, the, the you know, let, let me tie that back to something else I just wanted to mention is that basic connectivity, um, that's what, what, you know, cellular, like when, when the early days of cellular, having the ability to make a remote phone call was just fantastic, right? And then when things like BlackBerry came out, having things like wireless email was just fantastic. And we've kind of moved on in terms of the application space that people just expect connectivity all the time now. And it's got less of a value and they're looking for these higher level services. And we're to a point now where you're seeing organizations like Disney and even Google and Facebook looking at providing that connectivity part as part of their overall value equation. Um, that you're, you're kind of raising the standard that you're not paying per gigabyte, you're kind of may more paying for the service that you're getting and maybe you know, the price of what you're paying in connectivity is just buried in the overall bundle of services. I mean, I was just recently at Disney and it's, you know, it's not free being there. there, there is a cost to that, but I did really appreciate the fact that my kids could be on Facebook and sending videos and everything else. And it was over quote unquote free Wi-Fi rather than expensive cellular. Not free, but included, right? I love that business model. I think that's really yeah, going to look at it. Yeah. 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 I, I really like that business model. And I was trying to push my guests at the last week's show to get into that. But I'm happy you mentioned that because I think that's going to work. We got yeah, Microsoft. I think, that, I think we've seen that already. I mean, um, you know, I, I, because I used to be with BlackBerry, people paid $40 a month happily to get unlimited wireless email. Well, the average user back in the very early days was maybe doing 400K of data. Right, but they saw tremendous value in in the service provided at that time. Right, yeah. Not beyond the connectivity, it was just the value that they got. And I think those kinds of business models are what wins out in the end. Is that you're providing something that I really value because you know cost per gigabyte's only got one direction. It's yeah. coming down, right? And yeah. Wi-Fi is a dis could be a disruptive alternative to to the operators. Um, and again, as I might have already mentioned this, but but um, you know, are you really just in the cellular business, right? You should be in providing the wireless connectivity and any additional value added services you can think of. And so you need to embrace Wi-Fi from my perspective. So it's good to see tying back to the T-Mobile uh, Bright House uh, um, um, initiative. That, that, that's, you're going to see more of this. Right, absolutely. David, I wanted to ask you about Wi-Fi for connected cars, and we're actually nearly out of time here, but I do want to spend a couple of minutes with you on it, because yes. one of the big things that annoyed me tremendously at Mobile World Congress last year, this year, actually, was that this connected car story was all over the place, and nobody could really explain, honestly, exactly what they were going to do with it. Now, coming from uh, the Wi-Fi side, uh, how do you think, what do you think the role of in a use case sense, I guess, what is the role of Wi-Fi in, in the connected car industry? You feel? Well, I, I think the connected car, number one, has a lot of challenges still, right? I mean, you're seeing all the security things now hitting, hitting uh, the market. You're, you're dealing with a legacy architecture, shall we say. It's not designed like a modern PC or a modern smartphone that they, they have a lot of other places to fix. But from, from you know, as, a, as an individual, right? You know, as a, and you know, the studies have kind of shown I'm interested in security, I'm interested in um, safety, and I'm interested in enhancing my user experience, right? And I look at Wi-Fi, like, you know, like go back to simple examples. You know, my daughter lives in a very tall condominium building in downtown Toronto. Um, her car is three levels down from where the, her elevator access is. So why can't you drop the car off at the elevator uh, and have it connect via Wi-Fi, have it go park itself and, and let her know that it's securely locked? I mean, they have Wi-Fi in their building. Um, you know what it costs to run LTE down there. 
and not having external Wi-Fi on a car is kind of limiting from that perspective. The other thing I kind of look at, uh, there's a couple of other things, and I'll try and get these in quickly, is that my car, like right now, is sitting in secure Wi-Fi, really high speed, and it's not connecting. And my car actually uses a 3G connection to talk to the manufacturer for service information. But, you know, why am I not automatically spooling my music and what have you to it via Wi-Fi right now? Uh, why can't I do those things? Why can't I check on the health of my car from my laptop? Um, none of this is, is, is available right now. And, and it drives me crazy. Uh, you get me on my hobby horse a little bit, but it drives me crazy that a subscription-only connectivity service is going to attract some people, but not everyone. It's sort of like Google charging for you to use their search engine. That's one business model. You might get 20% of the users out there using it, but a bigger model is to get everybody to use and figure out better ways of monetizing this. So, um, you know, Wi-Fi, I can think of business use of Wi-Fi. You know, as soon as I pull into a parking lot or a parking garage, as soon as I go through a drive through I have a chance now with a big screen on, on my, my car, I'm not really driving anymore, to get in more information directly from that business so we can better conduct business. You know, as a consumer, I can find a parking spot. I can tell you what I want to pick up when I'm there. Um, I can see what your special coupon offers are. I can do all these things. And I don't need to go through a cellular connection to be able to do that. That, you know, we're seeing more and more businesses just have Wi-Fi as part of their equation. That is so cool. A lot of good applications, use cases there. Uh, fantastic stuff. And uh, David, I want to thank you for coming on the show. And we're going to have you back to talk more about that. Uh, and please, uh, offline, we'll talk about a lot more stuff because it's always okay. great to chat to you. All thank right. You. Now, on to something completely different, as they say, and uh, I'm wearing my NASA shirt today, and there's a reason for that, because I actually managed to get a NASA JPL uh, person on the show today. His name is Adrian Tang, and Adrian has been in the news, I think it was this week, either this week or last week, because yep. he's uh, developed, <laughs> he's, de he's working on a chip, he's invented a, a Wi-Fi chip that allows you to save, uh, I think the number from the NASA press release was 99.9% .9 of the power consumption. It's a completely new way of thinking Wi-Fi transmission. Adrian Tang, Dr. Adrian Tang, I should perhaps say, welcome to sure. the show. Hi, nice to be here. Great stuff. And yeah. where are you? You're in Pasadena right now? I'm in Pasadena, California. Right. Okay, good. No so why. Adrian, tell us a little bit about this invention. Uh, I was I was looking through all the press releases and so on. I was struggling a little bit to understand it. But now that we have you here, please tell us. Well, let me tell you where it comes from first. So um, what we do here at JPL, first of all, before I came to JPL, I was a 802.11 AD guy, so a 60 gig guy. And I was a 15.3C guy. So I lost a lot of money already. And uh, <laughs> then I moved into space instrumentation. So our group here at JPL, we build uh, spectrometers and radiometers to explore the whole solar system. And um, what happens with that is we operate at crazy frequencies. We operate from 300 gigahertz all the way up to 4,700 gigahertz to 4.7 terahertz. And one of the problems we constantly have with planetary exploration is other planets are very far away. So our instruments need to be low power because those planets, some of the other planets are so far from the sun, the solar panel doesn't do much. Also, we can't carry that much nuclear material. So we have to build low power solutions to, to do all this imaging and radar and, and other surveys. So one of the things we came up with is called a reflector ray. So you have an instrument shine on this reflector thing and it steers the beam so you can do the imaging. That way you eliminate a motor. Instead of having a motor doing imaging, you have an electronic scanner. So the motor's bad. First of all, it's a huge point of failure for a spacecraft. It's a moving part. It can't last seven years, eight years like these missions. And uh, secondly, uh, it uses a lot of power to move this giant platform that you have all the instruments on. So we got to doing that work and we came up with an interesting idea. Well, we don't just have to steer the beam. We can also put modulation. We could send data somehow. And that's how this work really started. Okay. So you've actually, first, actually I actually have two questions. Number one, can I please come work for you? Number two, uh, how do you, so how do you actually technically technically do it? You, you've sort of sort of done away with the transceiver side because obviously you know, regular radio works with transceivers. This actually reflects rather than transceive anything, right? Yeah. So um, what goes on is basically what we've done is we've offloaded all the carrier generation and amplification to the access point. So the access point has to generate the Wi-Fi carrier or subcarriers and the Wi-Fi access point uh, transmits a signal that we reflect. So what we do is we shape the reflection 
with the Wi-Fi packet or whatever type of packet. So uh, if you do 11A, for example, it'd be an OFDM packet. So the, the little reflector module doesn't have a power amplifier, it doesn't have a phase lock loop or synthesizer, but the symbolization's still there, the pulse shaping still needs to be there, frame coding, phi coding, just not up conversion and not carrier work. Right, Wilson can, you, Wilson, can you bring up the next slide, please? The NASA JPL slide, because this was the only, <laughs> this is the picture that I, I picked this off your, uh, I picked this off your, uh, I think off the official NASA uh, page, press release thing. It was, it's just a picture of your- uh, Of one of the chips, yeah. Yeah, one of the chips. Do you wanna explain that to us just a little bit, couple of minutes? Sure, so there's actually, uh, there's actually two chips in the system. So okay. one chip is this little reflector. And this little reflector is the one that does the phi. It does the frame coding, channel shaping. It does the channel coding as well, if you want to get complicated. And that's the one that goes in some wearable device. It doesn't use much power. It has no RF circuitry. But there's another like uh, subtle problem with the reflector link, which is that when you beam out, a, I don't know, either 5 gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz into a room, you're getting all this crazy reflection from everything else in the room. It's not just this little thing on your wrist that's going to reflect that, that carrier. It's everything that's going to reflect the carrier. So you need to deal with that at the access point because the, the room is much bigger than your little wearable. So it's like an in-band blocker problem. You're getting completely swamped by, the, by this whole room reflecting back at you. So what we have is the chip on the website is the reflector chip in the access point. And what that does is it looks at what's coming back from the room and it filters it out with some DSP. It removes the background blocker and allows that much smaller reflected Wi-Fi signal to come through. So, right. So you've actually documented that this works to the extent that you actually save 99.9% uh, so, of the battery power here? There's some subtlety there. So it's 99% of the RF transceiver power. Okay. Not the entire. So that's not counting framing, coding, you know, baseband. Okay. Yeah, okay. Or, or source coding. Okay. But it also works a lot faster, right? It works well, a lot faster. That's an interesting topic, right? Everything works a lot faster. If you take an 80211 AD or AC, sorry, AC transceiver, you know, it works at a certain speed. If you took off the protocol and framing requirements, if you took off the 80211 framework, those transceivers can also work much faster. All right. right? Yeah. So gotcha. We can only go as fast as 80211 says our channel lets us go. Right. right. Even if I had a billion gigahertz transceiver, I still only have a 54 megabit channel. Adrian, tell us a little bit about what applications you see for this. Uh, one of the things that were mentioned also uh, in, uh, previously in the press release and so on was yeah. obviously wearables because it, it's a short range technology if, if, I, if, if I've understood this correctly. Or would it also apply to longer range or how do you so, see that? Yeah, I can talk about it. Sure, it's intrinsically a short range technology because if you think about what we're doing, we're, we're reflecting, which means the signal, the power that you transmit has to go to the reflector and then come back. So path loss is much worse, signal to noise is much worse, but there's ways to deal with that. So right now we're doing, you know, six meters, five meters, these types of numbers, close range for your wearable. But if you bring in the, the MIMO or the beam steering, especially if you go to like uh, 1180 where there's beam steering, then you can overcome that path loss by, by focusing the beam nice and tight. So then you have enough SNR and then you could imagine doing this at maybe 10 to 50 meters, you know, um, it won't go through the wall, but that, that's the nature of 11 AD. Nobody wants Wi-Fi that doesn't go through the wall yet, but that might change. Um, and then the other thing, the, the more underlying question for this type, not just our work here at JPL, but all types of work is with the reflector is, is 802.11 framework really the environment we want to run these things under? Because if you forget 11 AC, 11 AC is too common, but if you look at 802.11a, right? You got to generate 52 FDM subcarriers. Then you got to put the guard interval. Then you got to put the preamble. Then you got to do the divided multiplexing for the input. So there's so much going on. And then you have to take an IFFT before you stream it. So there's so much like packet preparation and protocol preparation. Maybe it's not, 802.11 is not the best way for these wearable devices. Maybe there's some other simpler standard we could come up with. Well, wow, that's really cool. It's a great comment. And, and thanks a lot of, a lot of stuff there for us yeah. to think about. Let me ask you about the commercial side. Uh, so this has been patented by NASA JPL, presumably, and yourself. Yep, yep. and UCLA, and UCLA as well. UCLA. Uh, UCLA. Right, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, how do you see this uh, evolving on the commercial side? I mean, uh, it was also mentioned that there are some companies uh, businesses yeah. interested in this and and first of all yeah let me ask you that how do you see that 
Um, so it's it's an interesting problem. So if you stick with the 802.11, you know, type environment, which is, you know, it's much easier to get a, uh, gain market penetration because you're compatible with all the hotspots and access points all over the world. But, you know, if you pick up like, the, like I don't know, pick example, Broadcom 43400 chip, the, the new AC, sorry, 43460, the new AC chip, you know, it's 50% of the power is the baseband. So it's not a compelling market case to reduce power only 50%, and it's not going to get you in the wearable market. So that's tricky. You have to be kind of 802.11 compatible to get market entry. At the same time, you know, uh, you don't have the savings. So you'd like to do some proprietary protocol. Maybe you lighten up the packet, lighten up the framing, lighten up the channel coding. You know, something far simpler like Bluetooth. But then it's hard to get a new standard going. So yeah, it's not it's easy. Yeah, so it's kind of a double challenge. You know? You're championing in a, new, a, a new standard, actually. That's what you're telling me. Yeah, it, it seems to be, you know, the problem is the 802.11 protocol has grown and grown and grown and grown. It used to be, you know, 802.11a had some single carrier option BPSK. You know, now it's a monster, right? 802.11a is an incredible, you know, OFDM system with so much shaping, guarding, and channeling, adaptive constellation, beam forming technology. It's just too much for the little wearable to handle. Even if you can like make the radio and the transceiver zero power, handling all the control and framing is just too much for a wearable. It's more than the media processor is doing almost. Wow, that is so cool. I, I really like those comments. I, we gotta yeah, have you come back and we'll do a bigger panel about this because there's a lots of really interesting issues in that. Adrian, I want to really thank you for, for coming on. It's been a pleasure, and, uh, and sure. uh, we'll get back in touch. I want to know more how, how your project is proceeding. So sure. good to have you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our last segment today is about the battle for 5G, five, not 5G, but 5 gigahertz, the 5 gigahertz band. And right now, it's... Um, it's a controversial issue because LTE is battling for that band. It's called LTEU slash LAA. And that, of course, is the band where most of the Wi-Fi activity is these days. And so we've, um, we've had a lot of controversy in this area. And uh, to touch on that and also to uh, uh, talk a little bit about a, an event going on uh, next week in uh, the Silicon Valley area, the Bay Area, Here's uh, David Witkowski, he's a, a CEO president of uh, WCA, and I'm so embarrassed that I forgot what the C stood for when I first introduced you, so you can tell, tell us the whole name. And you're also a part of Mobile Experts Group as an analyst and a strategist. Uh, David Witkowski, welcome to the show. Thanks, Klaus. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, sure. the Wireless Communications Alliance is an yes. uh, organization in the Silicon Valley. Uh, we're celebrating our 21st year in 2015. Uh, I, I often like to say we were wireless before wireless was cool. And we were, uh, I've also been working with mobile experts on uh, a report, which is the carrier and public Wi-Fi, and the update for that on uh, 2015. And uh, that's sort of the, the seed of this event that's happening next week on August 18th uh, in Santa Clara, uh, where uh, we'll be talking about the uh, the battle for five gigahertz and and I agree with you that it is uh, a controversial topic. Um, I've been with the WCA serving on their board for ten years and I've been president for half of that time. Um, I can say that I've never had more trouble getting people to agree on the title of the show. Um, we've had some people who have had some trouble with uh, characterizing it as a battle, and, and I had one uh, company. Um, that uh, didn't even want to be on the show because they didn't want to get in the middle of this. So uh, in, in doing this uh, event production for 10 years in the wireless space, and we've touched on a number of controversial topics, so we don't shy away from that uh, controversy. I can say this is the most controversial event that we've put on. So yeah, it's a super, you know, absolutely. It's a super, super hot issue. And, 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 you know, the debate is very heated and passionate on both sides. I think you're actually doing this event. Can we pull up the, uh, Wilson, can we pull up the, the slide for the WCA show? Uh, you're doing this event at Qualcomm, uh, Qualcomm offices in Silicon Valley. And Qualcomm, of course, is right. one of the big uh, proponents of LTE, one of the companies pushing it really hard. And it can actually comment on this, perhaps, David. It can actually also be hard. I've been through the same process to find somebody who's willing to stand up for the Wi-Fi side. Can, can you comment a bit on that? 
Well, I think that some companies do straddle both sides. So I think they are trying to, to uh, walk a thin line. Um, so some companies serve both the mobile networks and the Wi-Fi industry. And uh, they are, you know, having to be very careful about not taking uh, what, what they perceive as taking a side in this debate. Um, you know, but, and so I appreciate that Qualcomm is willing to host the event, uh, even though they, um, you know, they are on both sides of the event. So I think they're doing the right thing of trying to uh, bring this forth and, and give us an opportunity to talk about it in, um, in an open fashion. You know, and the WCA has always tried to um, bring people together to, to discuss these uh, topics as uh, we go back into the early days of Wi-Fi, uh, back mm -hmm. when the debate about Wi-Fi was, should it be spread spectrum or frequency hopping? We were right in the middle of that as well. Um, so I think that, you know, there are some companies that are a little worried about, you know, um, having this turn into a fight. And, and yeah. I, I, but I think at the same time, I and mean, we know that the FCC has recently issued, the uh, Office of Engineering and Technology has issued some queries to the LTEU forum, asking them questions about, you know, uh, why did you, how did you arrive at your timing parameters? How did you arrive at the technical details of your uh, of your listen before talk protocol? And and so I think that there are still a number of questions that need to be addressed. And you know, I, I, we need to sort this out. Obviously, uh, is uh, it's an no, I think it's absolutely. I think you're doing you're doing absolutely the right thing by putting the show on. And I wish I could be there. And I really uh, urge everybody who's uh, the least bit interested in this, this issue to go to that event. I think it needs these things need to be discussed and. Uh, you know, there's nothing like a good civil debate to, to bring out the issues. So personally, I don't understand why you know people don't want to engage themselves if on the Wi-Fi side, for example. I think you should, everybody should go. So just remind us, it's on the 18th of yeah. August, and people who want to register for this can go to wca.org. Is that correct? That's, that's cor Yes, that's correct. Yeah. The registration will be open until 9 p.m. Pacific time on the 17th of August. Right. So I wish you a really, really great stuff. Thank you, David. I wish you a really, really good show. And please report back who won that debate, if anybody, if there is indeed a winner, or or just get get us some feedback. I'd love to hear more about it. How uh, I'll, I'll, we'll we'll communicate. I'll definitely let you know what's going on, and good and, stuff. Uh, maybe I'll write something up as a follow up to the event. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was uh, nearly the show for this week, and. Uh, Fantastic guests. I'm so delighted about uh, people talking on this show like this. It's fantastic. And just before we go, I want, Wilson, can you put up the last show? This is my show. This is my event. It's happening in Amsterdam on November 17th to 19th. This is Wi-Fi Now, the conference. And if you want to get to meet all the industry leaders in the Wi-Fi space in Europe, and for that matter, uh, also many international leaders as well, Come to that conference. You can go to Wi-Fi uh, now events slash uh, dot com slash Europe. Wi-Fi now events dot com slash Europe. Check out our full program. Make sure you register. There's going to be two hundred fifty, uh, 250 uh, passionate Wi-Fi people there, and I'll be there. I'll be running the show there, and it's gonna, we're going to have a great time. So don't miss that. On next week's show, I have thus far Vivek Ganti of Cable Labs. He's going to come on and talk about a new uh, IEEE standard called 802.11ai. It's also called FILS. And if you don't have any idea what that means, Vivek is gonna tell us about it. It's actually very promising. It has some super good carrier Wi-Fi features in there and I really want everybody to know about it. And I'm hoping to get one of the carrier Wi-Fi people on the show. I'm trying to get Boingo Wireless to join us on the show. If not them, it'll be somebody else. It'll be great. So thanks for joining us. Thanks to David Haidt, uh, Adrian Tang, and David Witkowski, and join us again next week, same time, same place, place right here on RCR Wireless News. Thanks, everybody. Wi-Fi Now is a production of RCR TV News. To suggest a show topic or to learn more about Wi-Fi Now events, you can reach Klaus Heading at klaus at headingconsulting.com. To find out more about Wi-Fi Now and all things wireless, visit rcrwireless.com.